things about locking people up and removing them from their community so that they lose their job, they lose their right to travel, they may lose their children, they may lose their home. When you take all of that away from that person and you put them in prison, most prisons now put their inmates to work. And there's a good argument to say that prisoners should be allowed to work, to have a job, to get some skills. I would agree with that argument. But when they're made to work under threat of even harsher punishment, like being put in the hole, where you're locked up in a room for 25, 23 hours a day, with no, with no, no nothing, if they're threatened with that sort of punishment, if they don't work, and then the work that they're forced to do is to make military belts and to make uniforms and to make items that, one, are being paid for at slave labor rates, a couple bucks an hour to the inmates who make these products, you're not only doing that, forcing them to work at the slave wages, but you're also depriving ordinary Canadians of that job opportunity. Why can't regular taxpaying Canadians get a job in a factory making uniforms? If we're going to make uniforms, give a job to a Canadian who's not in prison. But what happens is these prisons start to get contracts where they agree to sell their slaves who are forced to work against their will or punished if they don't. That's a form of slavery of, kind, of some kind. If you do that, you're depriving work from ordinary people out in the ordinary economy. And we know that in the U.S., in fact, uh, <laughs> there's supposed to be no slavery allowed in the United States, but if you check in the Constitution and all the subparts, there's an exemption that if you're convicted of a crime, then the laws against slavery don't apply to you. And that's, that's a fact. I, I, it sounds kind of crazy and out there, but it's a fact. And another fact is that right now in the United States, there are more African Americans behind bars than there were slaves during slavery. And these people are forced, again, to work in factories for pennies a minute, dollars an hour. Mark makes $18 a, a week, I think it is. 18 bucks a week is Mark's paycheck for working as a recreation clerk. He refuses to work for the military um, building on base where they make all the uniforms and helmets and all that. So he's a different job in the prison. But just to know that people are being paid such small amounts of money for work that could be done elsewhere, and that these prison industries are making sure those prisoners stay there so they can ensure the jobs keep coming in to make that. There's a lot of money going around. Once you start looking at how many billions of dollars that involves, you start to see why prohibition is not going away anytime soon. Because once you legalize marijuana, even though everybody's on board, all the evidence, all the public opinion, even politicians, everybody knows marijuana should be legal. That it's a joke. The drug laws are a joke. Everybody makes puns in the news about getting high. And we know that it's a victimless crime because nobody jokes about murder or rape like that. You don't make little jokes about those sort of crimes because those are crimes that people are hurting. Marijuana laws are hurting people who hurt nobody else. And again, that's the issue for me, is that when you start hurting people with the force of the state, the government, the police, and they're not hurting anyone else, that's a great moral injustice, and it's a civil rights um, crisis. Because in Canada, we are going to see private prisons opening and operating. Geo Group is meeting with the Canadian government. They're a registered lobbyist. They've got former elected officials on board doing the lobbying for them. It's on all the websites. You can go look it up. Uh, these guys are in our country promising to build prisons and lobbying for laws. So you want to know why Bill C-10, the mandatory minimums, just passed, even though since 2006 we've been protesting against every form of these laws? It's because you've got big money, like these guys, private prison companies, behind it. Sounds kind of conspiracy-like, but if you want to look to the United States, the evidence is all there that drug laws continue in huge part because police and prison unions and lobbyists are putting millions and millions and millions of dollars into it. Now that, of course, raises the question, what can we do about it? That's the hard part to I me. Mean, sure, if you can see that that's going on and talk about it, bring attention to it, that helps a bit. But it is a very daunting and depressing battle to try and be up against an international prison corporation that is going to turn peaceful, nonviolent Canadians into stock in their warehouses. The prisoners are of value. The more prisoners they can put up in their cells, the more money they're going to make, and that's despicable in every which way to lock up nonviolent Canadians. 
So that's the crisis we're really going to be facing over these next few years. Harper said that they would just slowly implement the laws, and we all know what it's like to put a frog in a pot of water and slowly heat it up. It's hard for Canadians to really get upset when they don't, they don't even know this is going on. As far as most Canadians know, prison is for bad guys. And if you're trying to defend prisoners' rights, you're trying to fight for the rights of prisoners and criminals before the rights of Canadians. And so the rhetoric and the conversation gets very inflamed and very uh, negative. But the best that we can do is point out the evil doings of others. And I have no qualms with saying that Stephen Harper is being evil. And then maybe we should all leave. <laughs> that was Harper. Right? Yeah. yeah. Was for for they heard you, Jody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have to evacuate. Yeah. Okay.